point in the workshop. We're going to begin with discuss the possibilities. I forgot my glasses this morning, so bear with me. Discuss the possibilities of transportation shuttle in downtown, the multi passenger golf cart and driver for a trial period of three months. Executive Director Patrick K. wants to rest. Good morning, Patrick. So, I'd like to be an executive director. That's nice. I just got a promotion. What did I call you? You call me the executive director. I'm going to be a director. That's fine. Economic development director. Thank you. Uh, this is a request from some businesses downtown. This is also just a, a trial to kind of figure out if this is, uh, will work. The idea is we have a parking problem downtown, which is a good problem to have. That means we have a lot of businesses downtown. We have a lot of activity. We have a lot of uh, residents and people who are using our businesses and restaurants downtown. The proposal here is a six passenger golf cart that we would rent from a company uh, who would drop, drop it off down here. It would be a gas powered golf cart. Um, we would run the golf cart between the um, days of Tuesday through Friday, from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we'd have a part-time person who would drive that uh, around the downtown area. We are gonna create a predetermined route in which they would uh, drive to. The idea is to take them from the parking lots that are on the outskirts of the downtown area into the major areas uh, Hill and Solomon Street. Um, this is to try to alleviate some of the parking issues and encourage people to park outside of the on street parking areas and go over into the uh, uh, lots on the uh, outlying areas of the downtown area. Would this be um, city personnel or doing the transporting, or is this an ideal opportunity for a business outside venture? Or The way this is proposed here is that we would hire a part time person. Uh, on a seasonal basis uh, at $12 an hour. Uh, the person would uh, drive around to the downtown, but they would be an employee of the city of Crystal. Patrick, where is the liability to the city? Uh, we've already talked to um, our liabilities uh, liaison with uh, HR, um, Greg Poole, and uh, we've covered all of our liabilities from GMA. Um, and so that has been addressed on there. Um, there are potential liabilities out there because this person will be driving around. Um, um, we're not going to be without them, unfortunately. Um, but uh, this has been covered in terms of our insurance. Okay. And the hours of operation? The proposed hours right now of operation are 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. This will be Tuesday through Friday. Of course, this is all a trial basis, and we're trying to figure out what works best. Uh, there have been proposals uh, to make this more for downtown employees. And so run this during times in which employees are parking and picking them up and bringing them into the downtown area. The uh, initial proposal right now, um, until we kind of evaluate this and see what's the best time to, uh, in which to do this project, is right now from uh, Tuesday through Friday, 11 to six, because those are the uh, times in which parking is at an absolute premium in the downtown area. Well, I'm familiar with the program they have up in Blue Ridge. I haven't talked with the mayor up there. It's been very successful up there. They're similar. They have limited spark parking downtown, but they have parking lots at either end. Right. And that's been very successful there. So I would really expect ours to be the same. Uh, this is something we're going to try out. If it works really well, and this is something that we can end up using uh, year round. I think probably as, as, as we use it, uh, we'll end up having an upsized. From a golf cart, uh, the people who love the stuff we got this morning. Right. I think people drive to talk to them and tell them what roof is going to have. We have looked into um, different types of trolley systems that are out there, some smaller trolleys, uh, as it makes sense for our size of our downtown. What may end up having to happen is having an additional uh, uh, vehicle and driver uh, due to the amount of time it takes to get from the around the downtown and drop off at various locations. I have weakness to Annapolis, North Carolina, which is a cotton up there, and it's like 50 more than that. They've done pretty much bricked all their streets downtown. There's no parking back there. And they, they use 15 passenger vans to transport people back and forth. And they've got a really growing little community there. And also down in Dublin, Georgia, right. they're doing the same thing with the even the passenger van. I guess we got to crawl before we walk through. We do. We, we, we do. got to do that. We got to do that. 
And we also need to be careful with that. There's uh, those are what's called pedestrian malls, where they you know, break off the entire downtown and, and make it only for pedestrian areas. There have been some communities that continue to use that to this day. There's some who have put it in, realized it was a mistake, and then had to reverse the decisions on there based on the fact of uh, different types of traffic in that particular area. So um, that is something to consider for us as well. The only question I have remaining uh, this time is uh, handicap. People that won't be accessible to handicap. As of right now, this program would not be. However, with the new LCI program, and once everything is all in place, uh, there should be adequate parking throughout the entire downtown with LCI. Um, those have not been striked off um, yet. Uh, those will be once LCI is completed. Um, and those have ramps throughout the entire downtown area. So you're going to see a lot more um, income accessibility throughout the downtown. Thanks. Good proposal. Any other questions on that? I do. I showed up late, but I just want to get clarification. It's the this is the shuttle that we're talking about. This is a golf cart shuttle. Okay. It's a six passenger multi passenger golf cart. Okay. Perfect. I just want to make sure I'm with the right part of the conversation. So sure. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Have a great day. Susan, did you have these lights? <clears throat> Moving into discuss recreational vehicle parking in residential areas. Deputy Six Manager Jessica O'Connor will address. Good morning. Good morning. We have had a few recent concerns from citizens regarding an increased number of residential vehicles in or recreational vehicles in residential areas and yards and driveways and even on streets. This most recently, even after I did this agenda, I had an extended two boats that have been parked in the roadway. Um, currently, our ordinance does not address recreational vehicles really at all in regards to where they can park. And I have attached our current parking ordinance um, that is really for more heavy vehicle parking. Even our heavy vehicle parking under section 90-100 does not limit a heavy vehicle being parked in a residential area. We were really looking at that as a um, large vehicle, cab, trailer, truck, tractor, trailer, or car carrier, and it specifically excluded recreational vehicles. From what I understand, when this was presented back in 2005, we didn't even want to say that you couldn't park, uh, park your tractor trailer in your yard because that was your way to do business. And so there wasn't anywhere else for them to park. So we did not mess with the tractor trailers and we specifically excluded um, recreational vehicles from even the restrictions that we had in commercial districts. So since it has come back up, I wanted to bring it back to you all to make sure that is still the road you wanted to take um, and that's sort of open for discussion at this point. So right now we have nothing that um, really enforces in residential. No, not for anything. Not for, okay. The only thing that we do have, and we've used this a couple of times recently, is no parking on the street. If it's been declared by administrative order after recommendation from the chief of police that there's some kind of issue like visibility or high traffic or a bad intersection, we have declared a few areas like George Circle um, and then the weird intersection over by the old mill at sort of Palace, Broadway, Central, I think that is. Um, a couple of those areas have been declared no parking after y'all have ratified administrative orders, but that's really on the street. So heavy vehicles have restrictions on commercial areas. They can't park there like a Walmart parking lot, um, but we haven't said anything about what can or can't be done residentially. We drafted some regulations back in the early 2000s and drew the hour of the citizenry. Both of them, like you say, the truck, the trailer trucks, and the boats and campus. Mm -hmm. So they never were adopted. Well, I would like to revisit it or at least maybe look at what other surrounding cities. I know that most of them don't have it. I did find Bur uh, Brookhaven has provisions, and I've attached that to your agenda as well, where they do limit recreational vehicles um, for, from being parked in the front or street side yard within 10 feet of an interior side lot line or within 20 feet of the rear lot line, which seems like a really you can't park it on your lot unless you have a very large lot. Um, 
How so, do they define recreational? Um, they don't in here. It may be in a different section of their ordinance, but in the actual recreational vehicle parking, they don't have it defined. I can look that up and, and find out. I think that would be my question is, at where do you draw the line between is, is a golf cart recreational versus mm -hmm. an RV mm -hmm. or um, so I would say I'm open to considering it, but certainly going forward with the understanding that it's already a slippery slope because we then have to make a determination for what's recreational and automatically someone's going to be upset and excluded because they have something that's 16 feet long and we made the cutoff 15. Mm -hmm. so, Jessica, how does Brookhaven, how do they define recreational vehicle or are there? That's well, that's what Otis oh, Flowers just asked. I, I, it's not, they don't define it in this provision of their code. When I did a search, the way you can do this on meaning code is put in recreational vehicle. There wasn't anything else in their code, if I remember correctly, that popped up. So I'm not sure that they did. Um, which would be problematic in and of itself. <laughs> so they just limit them, period, and, and instead of a, a number or two or three you can't have. I think just in our community, we've had maybe more than one part, and so that really kind of sparked some concerns with visibility um, from driveways and look around and try to get clearance and just obvious issues. So other than just aesthetics or, um, but I, I'll be very interested in looking at that. Now I will say if you do look at 90-100A, this is back in our code, it does say such vehicles shall not be parked on through streets. So any of those where you can't drive a truck through, it's, it's no truck traffic or in any manner which would impede pedestrian or vehicular traffic or constitute a visual obstruction to motorists. So we're always going to have that ability to say you, you can't be here because it does create some kind of obstruction. Um, that was what happened with the boat because it was so close to the intersection of where you turned onto the street, it, it was a visual obstruction. So we were able to make them move it even though technically there isn't a you can't park your boat on the street, but because it was an obstruction, they did have to move it. So you still have that provision. It's just that there is not a an explicit restriction for recreational vehicles on a residential lot. If it's in somebody's yard and pulled under, I know the one that has created a lot of concern is pulled under a storage shed. I mean, it's very clear it's behind the frontage of the house, so it's clearly not visually obstructing anything. Um, so there is also still the provision that you cannot live in them. So there was some right. concerns about that, but it's, we don't have any zoning for you to live in them. And Brookhaven actually allows that for 14 days in a recreational vehicle ordinance. So we don't allow it to be lived in, regardless of it's not, it's, it doesn't meet any kind of um, residential standards. Right. Yeah, there, one of the concerns that I guess what you're saying that, that has come before you guys is that someone has a recreation vehicle stored on their property, not blocking traffic, not blocking ingress, egress, and somebody's upset. Yes. Okay. And, and on the um, resident or the occupancy issue, I know of a situation where someone had guests come in from out of town. I mean, we're going to use common sense. So if they're just there visiting, that's right, not a residence. Right. And they're for a day or two, and they're staying there, and then, and so that was on South 6th Street. Probably two or three weeks ago. I think so there's one on Maddox Road where they obviously had pulled in for the weekend, had their little thing pulled out, their their side pulled out, and were gone that after that weekend. That's not a problem. That's not a residence at that point. Um, but permanently, no, they could not do that. I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. This is not just in my mind. Going down Solomon Street, the last little street you get to before you pass, um, going into Wall Street on the if you're going. East, it's going to be on the left. But if you're coming, wrong, I mean, um, but there is a a boat park and it's attached to a truck. And it's always there on the street. And I assume that this is a city street. <laughs> so what is the rule for that? Again, there's there's not really anything that prohibits parking a recreational vehicle or anything like that on the street, except for if it visually obstructs traffic. Now, if it's always there and sort of parked there, I think it does obstruct traffic if somebody's having to go into the other lane. Yeah, yeah um, I think it's really because 
because of it's a small street, and because of the way it, 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 it where it is, it it can only be it's attached to a truck, so the truck and everything is parked. And it might be another truck parked on uh, another vehicle parked on the street. It's a real short street. Um, it goes off of Solomon. Street. It goes off of Solomon onto this little street, and it comes. What was that street? Freeman or White? No, it's on the other side. It's um. <laughs> Parallel to the railroad track. What's the name of the um, um, Yeah, maybe Leah. Maybe Slate. I don't know which way. It's right behind Solomon Street. The street behind Solomon Street. You got Solomon. Then Slate. Clayton. Slate. Uh huh. Well, it's Slate and whatever it is that, that comes back around onto Solomon oh, Street. Uh, the one that goes in front of the, the metal place. Mm hmm. Yeah. That, that turns. It's the street immediately in front of whatever the blaze metal was. I know what you're talking about. Is it Leo Street? It could have been Leo. Leo mm -hmm. Street. The little short, as it turned into the current, it's a little short street. Mm -hmm. I have a, um, another question. I hate to go back in time, but Drew, you said that back in 05, um, maybe a list was proposed but not adopted. So, so it, back 2004 or 5, were we having similar issues? I mean, I do get quite calls and concerns. I wouldn't say it's a complaint, it's questions. I Can we have it? We're getting complaints about truck drivers, over the road truckers who would come in for a weekend maybe and they parked the truck, oh, okay. the truck and the house. So it wasn't street. a residential, I mean, like a, I didn't mean to say right. residential, a recreational vehicle. Uh, no, but we, when we started looking at the issue, we started looking at recreational vehicles. <laughs> We were also looking at box at that time, box, box trucks. People bring their tow truck to the home, and we ended up back off in terms of limiting those types of entities from using. But it, it was a, right. I think we bounced this one for several months back then. Well, I'm sure it. that throughout the time, I mean, the recreational vehicles have definitely changed and become more modern. They're definitely larger. I mean, they look more like a. Um, a home you could actually live in. So, I mean, I think I'm getting concerns with. We have school bus problems as well. The school system buses that the drivers take home during the day or the night. Parking on Fifth Street. Right. I'm not really getting many concerns on like a work related vehicle or something you do for work, but I am getting quite the calls. So, I just wanted to pass that along to staff that it's. Uh, just made mainly concerns. I do get calls where people aren't complaining. They're calling to say, hey, I'm going to go buy this RV. Can I bring one? Can I park it? Where can I put it? Can I have two? So I just want to be uniform and know exactly what to tell them. So. I think the alternative is you have to go rent a space. You, know, you have a storage yard. It costs people money. They don't want to do that. Right. <laughs> So the consensus is that we want staff to continue moving forward, sure. looking at the options and bring it back to a workshop that we can then. I would say a cursory look, not a yeah. great in depth look, because we obviously, mm -hmm. just to give us some framework, but not to spend 12 million hours on an exhaustive way, so that we can have a general idea about what the restrictions are. Because I already have a lot of questions, so I don't want you to get what? Can, can you give us some guidance on what you might want them to be? I mean, I, I don't really know what other than what we've already looked at. I don't know what else to tell you. Well, and I, I think that my concern is how, how we attempt to legislate private property and where we draw the line between what recreation vehicle is. I mean, because it's, I'm, I'm just thinking that I don't know what is a go-kart. You legislate private property all the time through your zoning and land use control. Well, I, but I guess I'm saying in terms of what's permissible because we're going to, is a go-kart, is a golf cart. I don't, I don't do any of those things. I have one vehicle. It's my car, right? So no recreational vehicle. I have a bicycle at my house as well, but that's it. So I, my concern is how, you, how we can make that uniform because it's, What's recreation in one community in our city may not be recreational somewhere else. So I don't, I, I'm just a little leery of us because of, I, I would say the history of how we have done our stuff up here, our ordinances, was making these sweeping changes about how things are supposed to be 
without really considering the real ramifications. And then we spend months going back through, okay, well, let's exclude this one. Okay, well, we, we shouldn't be upset about this. So I don't know the direction, but that's the concern that I have going in is that your your boat is too big or your boat is not big enough. So there's some inequity about it. So I don't know, but I don't want us to be in the gray area of deciding, I don't know, what's appropriate for recreational vehicle. Well, I, I'll let y'all know, I have looked at several cities already. Brookhaven is about the only one that does prohibit recreational vehicle parking or limited, restricted um, in a residential area. So I looked at Newton, I looked at Covington, LaGrange, Fayetteville, um, Peachtree City. They don't, they're, I'm not gonna be able to really find any good information. I mean, I can sort of make up my own, but I'm not sure how I mean, are we talking just recreational vehicles like an RV? Or are we talking golf carts and boats and everything else? I mean, I'm not sure exactly how strict y'all want to be or... Well, and the other thing that you said based on that ordinance that Brookhaven has is if you have enough land, then you are allowed to have a recreational vehicle. But if you don't have a big enough lot, so I guess if you live on three acres, you can have an RV, but if you live on a quarter acre lot, you're not allowed to have an RV. Already, I see where that's going to be a problem. And, and on the trailer, it's a landscape trailer that may be 12, 10 feet long versus a gooseneck trailer that's 40, you know, 30 feet, 25 feet long that carries heavy equipment. So yeah, and see, I wasn't even thinking about trailers as, so, but, as but a vehicle. So it it says in storage of trailers and recreational vehicles. So, so yeah, what if your trailer is for yeah. work? Because that's how I transport my lawn equipment. But Holly's trailer is for transmitting her transporting her recreational vehicle, then we get back into the, okay, well, whose trailer is, who is it okay for you to have a trailer for work, but not okay for her to have a trailer to transport her stuff. So in terms of direction, my leeriness comes from, I don't really know that there is anything established and it's going to become very cumbersome for us to decide whose trailer is okay. If what purpose and the intention and then then you, it becomes messy because we start making personal decisions about whose stuff is more valuable. Well, it's, it's going to be very difficult to enforce. If I have a recreational vehicle that I take with me when I'm on my job because I work two weeks, you know, away from home and come back for a week, that's something I use for work. So now it's not recreational, although it looks exactly the same right. as the one next door that uses it to go to the lake and play. Right. So I, I, I'm not... Do you all, as staff, get... A volume of calls or just concerns or questions not necessarily I'm not really attacking it like a complaint I get questions on can I do this and so just a few um, it seems to be more recent that we've received them out it up until this year I've never had anybody complain about that or they complained because it was in the roadway and they couldn't see around it that's right. that's pretty common but actually in somebody's yard just really I mean less than a handful right okay well, I think it's worth checking out, but maybe not in complete. I know that a new city like Petrie City, their homeowners associations of each subdivision or neighborhood kind of takes care of those things, which is why it's going to be hard to find cities that may have a uniform restriction on it. But as far as having the historical area the way we do, and we're definitely growing and putting more subdivisions and developments in, I would like to look at it going forward. Any other comments from staff or from the commission? I, 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 I kind of agree with Cora. I, I wouldn't want to spend a whole, whole lot of time because what I see happening is once we uh, decide that we're going to do something different and we park the RV, the next thing you're going to have is these truck drivers that own their trucks and their own land that want to park their trucks in their yards. So I don't want for us to have to go we already have um, rules and regulations set up for that, but that's something that, you know, we're opening ourselves up to. And that, those are some of the issues that we crossed before when we did that. And, and I, I think back in whatever year it was, I actually brought that up <clears throat> because I was familiar with a couple of other places that prohibited truck, large trucks uh, from neighborhoods. 
<clears throat> and it didn't go, if you all recall, that didn't go over very good at all. So, I mean, we'll research whatever you want us to research. I'm just not sure on the direction that we have as to what else to give you. Can we do a, you might know whether it's worth doing a survey and see if we're talking about five situations in the city or, or a dozen and figure out to the extent of what. What do you mean by survey? In terms of what, where you, we may have an issue, we may have to think of. Well, if you can find what it is you want to regulate, that's going to be hard to do. This thing I, I, I can't remember exactly like, what was our what was the regulation before Jessica. I'm sorry, but you're taking that. The so right now the only time only place that we really discuss recreational vehicles is in Article Five of our parking ordinance, which is heavy vehicle parking. And in that section, we define that as any large vehicle, cab, trailer, truck, tractor, trailer, or car carrier, including rollbacks and wreckers. We specifically exclude recreation vehicles from the definition of heavy vehicle. And we say in that section, such vehicles, being heavy vehicles, shall not be parked on through streets or in any manner which would impede pedestrian or vehicular traffic or constitute a visual obstruction to motorists. We have another provision that says it's unlawful for any person to permit or cause any heavy vehicle to be pulled, pushed, or in any way moved across any curb in the city. There's a couple little ways that you can say you can't park in specific areas if you have to cross a curb because you're damaging our property, or if it's obstructing some kind of vehicular or pedestrian or visual traffic um, for motorists. And then to park even in a commercial or institutional zone, they can only do that if they are engaged in loading or unloading activity where the driver is present and in charge thereof. Um, it's unlawful for them to permit or cause any heavy vehicle to be parked or stored on public streets or public rights of way unless the vehicle is actually engaged in loading or unloading activity where the driver is present and in charge thereof. If they're going to be parked in commercial and institutional zone parking lots, or if it's going to be illegal for them to do so, there's provisions about what kind of signs they have to have, where on light poles, um, how tall the signs, how big the signs have to be. Um, they can't use them to sleep or park overnight, but they can be parked in hotels and motels if they are registered guests of the hotel or motel. Okay, so, but that excluded recreational vehicles. Yes. So now what somebody's asking is, we have a situation where there's recreation one or two that are being parked in the front into the side of the house if they blade a load of gravel. Um, they're pulling up over the curb, so it's just insane. Is, is, is this something that we can be specific about that we can, y'all can uh, tell the rest of us what's excellent? What's, what's the situation? What is it? Right. Yeah. So there's there's the, the complaints that I have received. One is a boat that was on Pine Valley and Maple. Once you took a right on Pine Valley, it was right there. So if you were at that stop sign, you couldn't see around it. The boat situation, I think that's already addressed by saying you can't park somewhere that causes a visual obstruction. Um, that's already been taken care of and removed. There are now two RVs on a lot on Grove Lane. Um, where there is a house there, and it's an older RV and now a newer RV. There was some concerns that somebody was living in one, um, but they are not. And so, who was concerned that somebody was living? I'm sorry. Who was concerned? That some citizens. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so they reached out to us saying, "You have to do something about this." We've sent PD over there a couple times because we sent them once during the day, and they said, "No, this is taking place at night." We sent them at night. The RV is completely gutted. She's she's renovating it to sell, um, is what she's told two different police officers. The one in the front is a little bit closer to the road because she has one in the back, but it doesn't obstruct traffic. Um, from what we can tell, PD looked at that issue as well. Um, it's just parked, and it is within the the older one is under like a storage shed um, or a carport, I guess, a metal building, and then the other one is not. It's just in her driveway. But if you, I mean, Springer, there's an RV park there. Um, that one on Maddox seems to come and go. So it sounds to me like it's more of a nuisance than it is. I think it depends on who you ask. Right. I think that, that would be determined by, I mean, if we say code enforcement, that would to determine. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think. Now, to me, now, I, mean, I could be wrong. It sounds like that would be something for code enforcement 
to determine whether this is. Uh, I, I don't even see us having to spend that much time on this. Right. I have come with cars parked on the on the center right away for years and years and years. We don't enforce it by code, but we had to come up with no extra rules to make it work. Well, I would say that my concern after hearing that is that we're literally attempting to change the city ordinance for two concerns. One concerns, not even like life or business threatening issues, but because someone is unhappy with their neighbor. I will say we do have a lot of concerns about whether or not they're being lived in, um, but that's already addressed through zoning. So I, I don't think we need to adopt any ordinances to address whether or not they're being used as residences. Oh, so that sounds like we have some provisions already on the code that allow us to have some enforcement of it, whether it's living, whether it's obstructing traffic and some of those other things. Right. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not, I tell you, I'm not voting for ordinance because two people may have. What we specifically don't have is a complete prohibition to park a recreational vehicle or a heavy vehicle in a residential area. And I think the issue is more of it's being parked in the front yard versus being parked behind the property or All right. So I mean, if there's not room, if they're jumping the curb, and we can already deal with jumping the curb. Okay. Um, that's unlawful. Although it is just for heavy vehicles and does exclude recreational right now. So if we wanted to add that in, we could take out that recreational vehicles are not excluded. I like um, having, um, I was going back through an article five. We do have, I mean, it seems like we could, as long as we're sending code enforcement out there, I mean, my thing is um, the visionary any sort of obstruction. Um, I just need to know if I'm getting calls on, hey, I'm getting this new such and such, where can I put it? And I want to be able to tell them legally and give them direction without complaints or, you know, so forth. As of now, they can put it in their yard. There's not another restriction for that. Only before you adopt any ordinance, you need to have a legitimate governmental interest to warrant having an ordinance. And the restriction or regulation should be really the least restrictive measure that achieves your goal. So, I mean, it's, you know, this, this thing's a whole problem because you keep talking about different types of vehicles. What if somebody's got a 16 foot bass boat as opposed to a 22 foot bass boat as opposed to a 28 foot <laughs> pontoon boat? And yet, they bring their boats home with them for safety reasons, security. They have room to park them in the yard. Does the size of the boat matter? Right, I don't know. That's, well, I mean, that's, that's kind of the issue you got here. Right, that's the question that we would have to right. make a determination on is whose boat is okay. That's why I was you, asking. You know it before and you couldn't swallow it. So you left it alone. Mm -hmm. so kind of back to that same That's point. what I was asking, you know, in 05 or whenever it was proposed, what, what led to that and what happened? I'm just trying to go back well, in. I think the first question is, do we really have a problem? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've had concerns or questions, and Jessica said she's had some. So, like Doug said, maybe how many are we talking? What is the volume? I don't know. I have had questions or concerns just in my two years, but you know, I don't know how long this thing goes or how far back, or obviously we visited it before. You know, I don't know. I didn't plan on spending this much time on it so far. I just wanted to know exactly what we have. And Jessica, you've done a great job with, we have large vehicles, but not recreational. I didn't really know what constituted a recreational vehicle. It was my first time going through this. So that's just trying to get on a uniform, be able to answer questions. I'm sure. I don't Still don't think y'all know what a recreational vehicle is because I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of in the eye of the beholder, I guess you can say. And when in an 05, we were in terms of like box trucks and wreckers, we, we looked at it and said there really wasn't that big of a even though there were some issues that people didn't particularly like in the neighborhood. It wasn't overwhelming to the point where it was we thought at that time that we needed to eliminate people being able to bring their work vehicles home. Well, and I think Commissioner McCord made a good point. We do have Chapter 42, which is your nuisance chapter. So yeah. if it becomes an issue where there are six RVs parked there and boats everywhere and you can't even get into the yard and so maybe the fire truck or the ambulance couldn't get there, then we may have a nuisance issue that we could address. So I think that's a very good point yeah, I, I, that you could handle it that way. I left off that if they're using this and she's renovated it and using her yard to fix RVs, then you know that that may 
be part of our job card uh, nuisance. And that's, that's why I was suggesting that it, it may be a job for code rather than changing the ordinance. But if, if, you know, if she's got an RV that is not obstructing, you know, I'm, I agree with Mr. Wayland. I don't, I don't, I can't determine whose RV is prettier or it's a 2020 versus a 1920 and now, it's be moved. And also don't forget that motor vehicles and trailers are dealt with as inoperable or junk right, in so you have a 9142. Device, you have a tag and everything else. And, right. Uh, so if, why don't we just say if, if you have questions, if you will just get those people to contact staff, we okay. can go over all the different codes and we can explain it to them in detail and we'll do our best to, to handle it that way rather than you guys having to research all the different codes that can apply. Okay. I agree with that. We're good. Okay. Thank you. That's the Interlocal Cooperation Agreement established the Griffin Spalding County Land Bank Authority, GSCLBA. The Memorandum of Understanding for Property Maintenance of GSCLBA lots and related issues. WC Manager Jess O'Connor will address. Okay. As you all know, uh, we have a land bank authority here in the city and county, and we have since 2008. It was established by the city and county in November of 2008, which is required by Georgia statute that the governing authorities within that community have to really want a land bank authority. They have to determine what the purpose is, why it would be beneficial in that area. And so this has come back up because Ms. Church, who is here today, if we have any questions for her, um, reached out to me back in, I think it was February, saying that the land bank authority wanted to add a fifth board member to their board. Right now they have four. They have Mr. Deaton Galloway, who is the chairman of the authority, uh, Mr. Jim Smith, who's the school board appointee, um, Ms. Patty Beckham, who is one of the city appointees, and then now Mr. Brett Haynes, who filled Ms. Shirley Gardner's um, position when she resigned because of health issues. When she resigned, that sort of prompted them to go back and look and see what exactly um, we were doing and then asked us to update our interlocal cooperation agreement to allow them to have that fifth board member, which the state allowed back in 2012. I had some concerns as to whether or not they had properly noticed the meeting that they voted on um, to add that fifth board member and then also had some questions as to the procedural um, impacts that that had with the city and county who appoints that fifth board member and how that really works because the law is, I will say, quite confusing, I think, Virginia. Um, very nicely gave me this lovely, about 150 page um, resource manual to review. So, can I forward it? We're gonna have, we're gonna have a tutorial I'll for be you happy, afterwards. Happy to forward it to you. I'm not gonna read it to you because I'm gonna have to read you comments tonight it's about this long too. So you don't wanna hear from me that long twice. Anyway, I wanted to sort of go back through when I was going to update the cooperation agreement at her request. I realized that there's a lot of provisions in here that I did not know. I'm assuming some other people don't know because a lot of it we don't follow. And so I didn't want to draft a new agreement knowing that a lot of the provisions in here we don't follow. So I wanted to go through them and see exactly what it is y'all wanted us to do going forward. The first thing I think that is the most important thing to know is why we established the Land Bank Authority. And what it says is to foster the public purpose of returning land, which is in a non-revenue generating, non-tax producing status, to an effective utilization status in order to provide affordable housing, new trade, commerce, industry, and employment opportunities for the citizens of the city and county. So in 2008, that's what we wanted to do. That's why we established this Land Bank Authority. Also, we were sort of concentrating on properties that were blight and deteriorating in the community and creating more of an economic burden for us than they were an economic generating property. Um, and I'm going through this page by page. I think you have it as an attachment if it's pulled up on your, on your um, computers in front of you. So on page two is article one, it's establishment and purpose. The land bank authority will inventory, organize, and classify on the basis of suitability for use manage, maintain, protect, rent, lease, repair, insure, alter, sell, trade, exchange, or otherwise dispose of under such, under such terms and conditions as determined in the sole discretion of the authority. So this is what they're going to do with properties once they acquire them. They're able to acquire title to certain tax delinquent properties and then they can keep them, hence the word land bank. 
or they can sell them, they can rent them, they can lease them. This is all the things that they are allowed to do to those properties. Um, under Article 2, definitions, page 3, there is a definition of an appraisal, and I'm not sure that we're following this. It shall mean a valuation or an estimation of value of property by two disinterested persons certified as real estate appraisers. I think at this time what we're doing is using the value of the tax assessor, and that's not what this definition is. Um, so that's something that we need to look at as well. Is that a um, constitutional issue, or is that something that we can change the language? That, the, so the land bank statutes, that's the other thing that Virginia made to answer for me. Um, when they voted back in, I think, 2013, they voted to continue under the 2008 statute and not the 2012. So I don't, do you know what the difference, if that is a difference in there? The appraisal value? I, I think that's only set out in the intergovernment agreement. I don't think that's a potential error. The 2012 agreement or legislation was far broader than the original land bank legislation which we adopted here in 2008. The 2012, as I recall it, gave you the option. You need to continue under the older kind of governmental agreement with the county. Or you could upgrade basically to the new law by adopting a new kind of governmental agreement. And I think the city did it and the county didn't. Is that right? All I know is I cannot find one that's been signed by both parties. Yeah, I don't think it, from the documents that we have, nobody did it. So okay. that's what we were looking for. That's what we can't find. So if we want to move in the, that direction, I sort of needed <laughs> some guidance from them before we prepared a bunch of documents not knowing what there we There was something to do. in the 2012 law that was a problem. And was it, was it more independent? I don't know if it was more independent, but it was more authority, more ability to do things with property. I'm not sure if it was condemnation rights, but it was something that was more power and authority than what any gallery wanted the authority to have. Well, they have more, I think they have more funding sources, more self financing options. Um, and then, it, it act, according to their resource guide, um, it gave them, it encouraged them, and authorized them to be more responsive to locally authorized priorities. I think in the discussions that we've had in the past, we have certainly done that. We, you know, adopted a resolution as did the county to tell the land bank authority that we only wanted them to sell properties if they were going to be owner occupied, or if they were going to um, require the owner to, if it's an adjoining property owner, to combine that parcel and make it more of a conforming use. Because as y'all know, a lot of our, our parcels were platted before our, our zoning ordinances, and so they don't meet whatever the conforming use of, is of that zoning district at that time. So in some of these areas, we have these 0 .08 um, or 0 .10 lots where next door the land bank owns one that's 0 .10, and so if they combine those two, although it doesn't meet the quarter acre minimum, it's much better. And so we, we have donated even, I think Virginia can talk about, or sold to the adjoining property owner under the condition that they will have to adjoin this property to replat them to show them as one parcel. So there's a lot of good that has come from what we've done with the land bank, but I, I think the, my biggest concern is going through this knowing that we don't do some of the stuff that we say we're going to do and what is it that y'all want to change. And then also figuring out, do we want to continue operating under the 2008 statute of the 2012 statute with a fifth board member or not. Um, so if we want to keep going through this, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what um, I sort of made note of. If you look at page nine, this was acquisition of property under article five. This is where, what, how the land bank can acquire property. They can do so by donation, which we do have some people that will say, I don't want this property anymore. It's a lot of it is because it's a nuisance and we've said you need to tear it down or fix it up or we've already torn it down and so the people just don't want to do anything with it anymore so they'll donate it to the land bank. Um, the land bank can purchase properties from third parties. They can also accept property that's been forfeited because of the asset forfeiture law, the criminal statutes um, that we have. Are you on a page or are you on an article? On page eight and then now nine. 
Um, in the past, the land bank has asked for Ms. Hollums, the tax commissioner, to initiate judicial in rem tax foreclosure, which gives them more um, legal authority, legal ownership right after that foreclosure. So what most people think of when they think about land bank acquisition is your tax sales. So when you go down to the courthouse on that first Tuesday of the month and they're, you're bidding on properties there, the land bank authority, and this is number six um, of Article 5, I think it was, on how they acquire property, Article 5. Um, they shall bid, and that bid shall comprise the authority's commitment to pay not more than all costs of the sale and its assumption of liability for all taxes, accrued interest thereon, and penalties. And if there is no other bid, the tax commissioner shall accept the authority's bid and make a deed of the property to the authority. So really what that means is whatever Sylvia has it listed for that day is the minimum bid. The land bank authority can offer that to her and then if nobody else bids on it, it becomes land banks. So you have to realize at that point, the properties that nobody else is bidding on aren't the best properties at that point. Um, so that's sort of what the land bank acquires, or they may have acquired something else because of donation or, or a sale or a purchase from a third, third party, but most of it comes from tax sales. So when the land bank acquires that property, um, Ms. Church now comes to housing council with myself, with Mr. Jacobs, with Mr. Haynes, with um, the county, and then also the housing authority. And so we've done a much better job in the past year or so of coordinating what needs to be purchased and what doesn't. Um, for a long time, it was just anything that wasn't bid on, they took, and that became problematic because we didn't really know what it was or if it was needed. Um, for instance, they own some detention ponds and subdivisions that were never built out. That's not going to help anybody um, in future development or put anything back on the tax digest to make it revenue generating. So for the most part, that has sort of ceased and we are now getting properties as the land bank is that needs to um, be held for some kind of economic purpose. I think the problem has become when you acquire it at a tax sale, you have 12 months from the date of that tax sale plus at least 30 days whenever you decide to notice the prior owner that you're going to foreclose their right to redeem their property. In those 12 months, what is happening now is the property is just going to hell in a basket. We have citizen complaints that are nonstop, especially this time of year, um, about the maintenance of the property. And this church and the land bank can't really do anything because they don't own it outright. The person that still technically has the legal ownership is whomever it was sold from for not paying taxes. So if Joe Smith owned the property on the date that Ms. Church went and bought it or acquired it from the tax sale, Joe Smith is still the responsible party for that 12 months plus 30 days from the notice that Ms. Church gives him saying, I'm gonna foreclose your right to redeem the property. You can't explain that to Joe Smith. You can't explain that to the next door neighbor. Nobody cares that Joe Smith still owns that property and has the interest of being the one to have to maintain it. So what happens is they call us, they call the city or they call the county because they see Griffin's Law and Landbank Authority and they say, well, that's the city or the county. You need to go cut it or you need to tear that house down or you need to make all these people quit playing horseshoes on that lot or whatever the case may be. And we can't do it either because we're trespassing. It's not our property. We can't go on private property and cut it. Um, not only is it trespassing, it's also a gratuity because we can't do something for a private purpose, um, not in that regard at least. So we have several issues that have arisen. They always are worse during the summer because it's grab season, um, but they seem to be getting more and more prevalent. Um, I don't think it's any fault of this churches. I think it's just because the land bank authority has more property than they've ever had. If you continue to acquire property and don't sell it as fast as you acquire it, then you obviously are gonna have more than you had in the past. Um, what that's doing is creating a situation and, and we want them to hold some because we want to be able to market it. We want to be able to tell a developer, the city has this new infrastructure right here. The perfect example um, would be D.F. Fuller and Edgewood. We bought all of those properties from Mr. Glover. We tore them down. Um, we've been maintaining those lots. We have uh, CDBG about to occur there, so they'll be bringing infrastructure there. We hope um, the Land Bank Authority has a ton of lots there on D.F. Fuller. West College, and then even on 15th Street where the uh, Housing Authority has some chip properties. We're getting a really good critical mass where we can say, here developer, come look at this. We want you to buy it and not just sell them willy-nilly to you know, Joe Smith over here and then Jessica Smith over here. So you, we're getting to that point 
I think the problem that I had in reading all of this is I'm not sure that we know where to go from here. So do we want to continue acquiring property or asking this church to acquire property or not to acquire property so we can figure out where we are and what we have? So if you continue on in Article 6, this is sort of what they're talking about when they have properties, what they're supposed to do. Um, section B, number one, all property acquired by the authority shall be inventoried and appraised, and the inventory shall be maintained as a public record. This church does that. We have a master inventory list. We sort of know what they have. Um, I don't think there's been any tax sales lately, so we don't really, yeah, we don't have an updated one since December, but only because it hasn't changed. They haven't acquired hardly anything, probably. Maybe through donation, yeah. a couple. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's another issue I'll, I'll mention in just a second. The other, the other concern that I have that I'm not sure the best way to do um, is number two, organize and classify the property on the basis of, of suitability for use. At this point, how many pieces of property do y'all have? 437. Okay. So the Landing Authority is one of the largest property owners in our county, not by acreage, but by number of parcels. <laughs> To classify and organize those based on suitability for use, I think is very important. That would help everybody in the long run figure out what to do. But Virginia is a part-time employee. Um, and it's just Virginia. So you mean like suitability like, for instance, a block for block revitalization? You mean that? Well, I think it, is it vacant? Is it um, is there a property owner next door that may want it? Is it one that needs to be you know adjoined? For instance, we have one where I'd really like to be able to give it to the person next door, but the person next door is not a great, great tenant. And it's a, it's a landlord tenant situation and we have code enforcement issues with that person. So yeah, I wouldn't consider that one that I'd be willing to give to the next door neighbor. Um, is it one that we need to hold because we have all of this other in the area? I asked Ms. Church recently about some property on Chapel, I think it was between 3rd and 2nd, that we thought may be a great place for Ms. Flowers Park. It's not that great because of just the topography of the land, but they were willing to do that when I saw how many there were right there. They took it off an agenda. Um, so little things like that where if we already know, we've already done that suitability for use inventory, maybe at that point it doesn't even get to somebody if somebody offers you know a, a, what they get are sort of measly little offers i want to you know buy this property for five hundred dollars the tax assessed value might be forty five hundred dollars just for the land whether or not that's a valid assessment or not i think is another reason why those two independent real estate appraisers need to happen but again it's very hard to justify that when you're talking five hundred dollars do we um, see the project over time now that it's been quite some time. Have we seen how this is working to revitalize and turn things around? I mean, there's it still too premature, like not enough time or we we have a couple spots like the sort of ministry projects. Right. There are some some success stories. Yeah, and there certainly are, and that's that I think would be a big one. And that's one of the things that is, is specifically mentioned in this interlocal cooperation agreement. If there is a nonprofit organization that is coming in and saying we want these properties because we're going to, you know, have them owner occupied and it will be affordable housing in an area that needs revitalization, that's one of the first things that it says. There's a priority list of how you sell them. Um, and 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 that's number one. So I think that has worked well and the areas have been able to do that. Um, I think at some point it just got a little bit too overwhelming for half a person to handle. Um, and so there's, there's, for an example, we had um, on Ray Street, we have a property where the people want to purchase next door. They're homeowners of the, of the adjoining parcel, but they've already gone out and put a tiny house on the lot next door that we tore down several years ago. So we have a $6,000 lien on it. First of all, we don't allow tiny houses here. Second of all, you don't own it. Third of all, what are we going to do about this lien? Because we've already spent all this money getting the house torn down. But at the same time, you got to balance the interest that, well, if we go ahead and let them have it, then they can maintain it. Um, because that's sort of the next. If we go ahead and let them. You, know, you said the person that lives in the house is a renter. They no, it's an owner occupied house. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. But so they have put a tiny house on the land bank lot. On the land bank lot. Okay. Is that tiny house a part of 
the house that they live in or is it somebody else living in the tiny house on the other lot? I think what we found out is she's using it for like her she shed almost. Storage, yeah. Her what? Her, you know, little she shed. Your little, your own little space, <laughs> like a dollhouse almost. Um, instead of a man cave, they call it a she shed. <laughs> Either way, it cannot be the primary structure on the lot. Right, right. You got a she shed. <laughs> What's the difference in a she shed though, and like a like a storage barn or you could not you cannot have just an accessory structure on a lot you have to have a primary structure that doesn't meet the zoning qualifications for a primary structure in that zoning classification okay. so if they built a house then they could have their little she shed or accessory structure okay. in this instance if we're and, and they haven't even they don't own the property yet they they put in an offer um, so it's on the land banks agenda but they've already put it there and one of the conditions is going to be you have to combine the lots and make it one parcel. Then the she shed can go there, it's an accessory structure. But as of now, it's the primary structure on that lot. And it, it can't be because they don't own it and because it doesn't meet zoning qualifications, requirements in that area. I mean, that's just an example, but it, it, we find it a lot. Um, and again, no fault in this church, but you, you, you can't manage 400 and something properties as one person working part time. So, and, and it's not just the landing authority that's having trouble. We, the city, have not done our job either. So if you look at page 11, um, section C, again, this is in the administration of properties. This is review of standards, priorities, and procedures. So, so the landing authority, their board, during its first meeting each year, shall set definitions of low income and moderate income that are to be used in the execution of Article 7, so how they are going to sell or donate property. Um, the county and the city shall submit definitions for their respective jurisdictions at the first meeting of each year for approval by the board. Had no idea until I, until I started reading this and saying, what, what does that mean? Um, so if you look at it, it says that we're supposed to use our census, another reason to fill out the census, so that we know what our income data is. Low income is 50% of said median, or the city limits of Griffin, and 80% is moderate income. You can even use that as, as um, delineated as, as the census tract. So if we wanted to say for this particular census tract, this is low income, and so you know, landing authority, you need to look at this when you're going to give or, or sell property. Um, but we haven't done that. We haven't given them that information that we're supposed to do. Um, so whether or not we change things in here, I think it's just a good reminder as to what we need to be doing so that they can do what they need to be doing. Um, Article 7, disposition of property. Again, this is how they give it away. Um, if you look at section B, criteria for conveyance, that's where it talks about the first thing that we want to do is give it to the neighborhood nonprofit entities or governmental agencies which would effectively use the property for the development or rehab rehabilitation of housing for persons with low income. There's, there's three different things in here that we say are priorities. I think what we really should have done based on just sort of the legal aspects of this agreement, when we said we wanted to be owner occupied, we should have updated this in a local cooperation agreement and say that's one of the criteria for conveyance. We didn't do that. Um, so we need to do that as well if that's still the route we want to take, which of course is staff's recommendation at this point. Jessica, did we write this or is this something, or did you already ask this question? Was this something like for the state? Was this Okay. We probably cut and paste it from the vacant land bank. Can we take things out that we? I think that's based on the way I'm I'm reading that y'all want to go. We need to go back through and see what is required by state law. What did we get? Because we probably looked at Macon's and said they have a very active and um, effective land bank. And and what does the authority want? What does the county want? Um, because this and we'll get to this sort of at the end. This is a very um, powerful agreement right. that we need to make sure that we're really taking into consideration. I mean, do we want to curtail this based on how our operations have been? Or no, no, no. no. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Okay. I, don't know. I don't know when we did this, there was some stipulations in here where we tried to protect the property so that they would go back into home ownership 
or um, it would be to somebody that was uh, that was building, trying to build a subdivision to upgrade, really upgrade housing. Somehow in, in here, we had we got to the place where the very people that we were trying to keep from getting their hands on these properties are basically some of the ones that have these properties. Uh, for instance, we have a slum lord that has acquired several land bank properties. He even tried to swap land bank properties that our land bank has for, um, that, that he has acquired from the land bank for city properties that the city had, the good property. So my concern is, how did that happen? Yeah. What 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 we got involved? I am not sure. I know that since I have sort of been involved, and I think Ms. Church probably sort of came in after I did, we did make an exception for a townhouse at Carrington because none of them are in our occupied. So we did sell that one to a, an investor um, who does rent it. The other ones, the way that I know that it is problematic or in my opinion what's problematic is the owner occupant requirement we are allowing immediate family of the person that purchased it to live there i don't know that we really again have any way with half an employee to monitor whether or not that's the case mm -hmm. so we i know for a fact we've had a guy come in and buy eight or nine lots in pecan point and they're all for family and i'm not sure how that's really going to work um at what point the con point, it's out in the county if you're going down um, towards Ingalls on 19. So, I, you know, at what point do you say, no, it has to be just you, or do we say it's okay that your, your son's going to live there, or is it okay that your aunt's going to live there? But they're in his name. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and he's acquired these land back properties for what, what? To, to build single family homes consistent with the zoning in that neighborhood. But at, at what price? I mean, what is the, what is he paying? What are they paying? Are they paying uh, market value? What are they paying for the lots? You remember? Uh, he, he is, that particular buyer has been much in line with the recommended benefit. So what Ms. Church has done since she started with the land bank, there used to be really no rhyme or reason as to what the price ended up being if you wanted to purchase one. You just submitted a price and it was like, yep or no. Um, she has done a recommended minimum bid that she presents with her staff report and as to a recommendation as to what, whether they should sell, whether they should keep, at what price they should sell, and she does that based on tax assessed value. And it's how much of tax? 25% of the tax assessed value um, of whether it's a land, whether it's got a house on it, whatever that may be. So she gives that, that recommendation um, and then either the person can, can make that bid or they can choose to go lower or higher and then if her board has to vote on whether or not they'll accept that bid. Okay. Uh, if you go to page 14 at the top is D, disbursement of sales proceeds. I'm a little confused with this one. Um, back in definitions, we do have a definition of excess proceeds, which is the difference between the amount received by the authority through the sale of the property and pro rata disbursement to the parties to the extent of their respective tax bills and costs. But this doesn't say excess, it's just sales proceeds. So the proceeds, if any, shall be allocated as determined by the, by the authority among the following priorities. To the parties, which again is the city and county for establishing the land bank, and the school district in proportion to and to the extent of their respective tax bills and cost, including any abatement liens and special assessments. To, secondly, to the authority to recover its expenses. Third, to the authority to further its operations. And fourth, to the county and city in such proportions as the parties may agree based on the percentage of contributions by each party. We don't, I don't know that I can think of one in this church, correct me if I'm wrong, that we've had excess proceeds over and above what the tax sale extinguishment was um, or above what maybe an abatement lien has been. But we're also not really following this disbursement at this point. Um, at one point, I think this was in 405 North Hill Street, which if y'all remember was the big, just sort of, 
crazy house pieced together like a like a fun house um, that we had 20 years worth of nuisance abatement actions on and finally were able to demolish I don't remember that's about five the, years that's ago. That's by the old church, old Catholic church sir. It is across the street from the uh, alleys. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have, yeah, the yeah. headquarters. Um, so we had a bid on that one, and it was, I think, for $5,000. Well, the city had a, almost a $20,000 abatement lien, and there was no discussion of the city getting any of that money. At that point, we have done, year, it really wasn't about the money, but years worth of work to get it to the point where it is a vacant lot that should be developed is right on the corner of North Hill Street. It's, I think it's a great lot and would be a great commercial location for something. But there was just going to be that they kept the $5,000 and I'm thinking, wait a minute, we, we did all of this. We're not asking for 20, but we're saying you got to share some of this because we're also paying your operating expenses. So the land bank comes to us in the county every year and says, here's our operating expenses, y'all have it. Um, they are becoming a little bit more self-sustaining at this point, so they are able to cover some of theirs, but nowhere close to half, I don't think, of now. Um, so Virginia and I did enter into an agreement that we would receive a certain percentage of any that had a lien on it, but then I found this, and that's not even following what our, what our cooperation agreement says. So I'm not real sure how we want to proceed in that manner um, and sort of needed some direction from you all. We also need to take into consideration that state law says that any funds should go first to the land bank operations and sort of switch the priority to their in the campaign. So we need to, and I think that that was a pun agreement by the parties. So there is a provision in that state law section that says a pun agreement by the parties. So obviously we didn't agree to that. And I think that's because we fund the land bank. In Macon, they fund themselves. So of course they get the proceeds first. And then it goes to the, the taxing districts within that jurisdiction. That's not how it works here yet. If at some point they do fund themselves, then of course they should keep it first and then it comes to us because don't forget they're extinguishing our taxes when they, when they acquire it because we've allowed them to do so by this agreement. So if they're going to extinguish whatever taxes have been owed, and some of them is very nominal, $400, $500 total for the tax bill for maybe three years. So $1,500 divided out amongst the three entities really isn't that much. However, they're extinguishing the taxes, so we're not going to get those back. We're paying their operating expenses. Maybe we have a lien on it, and they're going to keep all the money. I think that's why we said, no, you're going to give it to us first, and then you can keep anything that's left over. Because it does say in that state law statute, upon agreement by the parties. So I think when we originally established the bank, the hope was by at least by now, the land bank would be self-sustaining. Um, because we followed the Macon model, and theirs was, uh, it didn't take nearly this long. So, at this point, um, is there any way that they're, they're receiving enough money that we can start to back off from the amount of money that we fund? The last two years, the, the portion that we have had to fund has gone down. Yes, I think this year it was 43 five. And last year it was 45, and the year before that was like 48,000 per fiscal year. That's per that city. That's, each of us. Yeah, each of us funds that now. So, I mean, that, that's something that we talk about. I feel like almost every budget year in the county, I think Ms. Church and Mr. Galloway have to go over there for one of their budget meetings, maybe not this past fiscal year, but before, and explain why it's something that still needed to occur. And the reason that that's such a big deal, um, if you do go look, Skipping a little bit, but on page 20, the effective date of this agreement is January 1st, 2006. I have yet to figure out why it was two and a half years prior to when we signed it. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a typo, um, but it was signed November 17th, 2008. I don't know if maybe they had already started acquiring property. I'm not sure about that, but it's renewed automatically. Unless any party, which is us or the county, withdraws at the expiration of any one year term by giving 90 days written notice to the other party. So if it was something that we wanted to say at this point, we don't want to do this anymore, we give them 90 days notice, and upon our withdrawal or the county's withdrawal, the authority is dissolved. It, the end. Um, which is why I said this is such a powerful agreement and it needs to be right. We either need to operate under what the provisions are 
We need to adopt the provisions that we want them to be consistent with state law, which I think, again, we need to do some research on 2008 versus 2012 and exactly what the authority wants to do. Um, and then we need to bring that back to y'all to say, where are we at this point? So that's a really, you don't see that much in an, in an agreement. Oh, Drew, correct me if I'm wrong, but that a unilateral termination when you're, you're, you have established something that then you can take away is a big deal. Um, so we sort of need to know what our governing bodies want to do going forward. Is, do y'all believe it's working enough? Are there things that you want to see changed? How do we, is there, is there, at, at one point from what I understand, historically when this was all established, we were thinking that it was going to be a city sort of run under a city department as planning and development. That person, the executive director of the land bank would be an employee of the city. And then took on a, a life of its own, which I think is fine, but do we need some more, um, in our housing council meetings, we talked about some more oversight from the city and the county, which I think is why the county appointed Mr. Haynes. Mr. Haynes is our building official as well as the county's building official with Charles Abbott. He's a resident here in the city. Um, so I think that that was a great appointment, but do we need more? Do we need to say, well, each development director of the city and the county need to be board members or how, what do we want to do to make sure that we're actually, again, going back to the purpose of the agreement, returning land, which is in a non-revenue generating, non-tax producing status to an effective utilization. And I'm, I'm just not sure that we're meeting that, which is why you have a second um, attachment, which is the MOU between the city of Griffin and the housing authority. That is so that we can maintain these land bank properties. The county does not have the same agreement because they're a different animal. If you have an overgrown property in the county, that's very different than you have an overgrown property in the city where you have neighbors and you have people that are concerned about what that property looks like. So we did enter into an MOU with the housing authority back in August of 2018. That so we just want to try this out, see if it's worth us maintaining because at the time, the land bank had somebody maintaining the properties within the city but we didn't feel like they were being done to the conditions that they needed to be because we were still getting complaints. There was no way for us as the city to monitor that. I really don't think there was any way for Mr. Joyner at that time to monitor it because not only was he trying to monitor properties that he was acquiring, but also then how they were being maintained. So we said, no, we're going to do it this way because we pay you for that. We're just going to keep it in house and we're going to do it now. And we did that by contracting with who the housing authority uses. And they've done a great job with it. It's just, is that what we want to continue to do? Because it's a lot of money. Um, so we pay them $50,000 and it really needs to be more because we didn't update this since 2018. So the more properties have been acquired, more properties are now being maintained. And he's just sort of out of the goodness of his heart doing it at this amount. They'll charge us for like an initial cleanup of a piece of property, but then maintaining the monthly has remained at this 45, 45 per month. So it really needs to be a contract if we want to continue this with us, the housing authority and the land bank authority, since it is their properties. Um, and that needs to be updated as well if you all want to continue doing that. Um, and which is also why our contribution to the land bank went down because it's now going in this fashion to the housing authority instead of to the land bank. So we used to contribute about $95,000, almost $100,000, but when we started maintaining the properties through the housing authority, it's not that we don't have to pay that anymore, it's just who we're paying it to is different. When um, Chairman Flowers, I'm sorry, Chairman, Chairman Taylor and I met about, about four months ago at the staff joint meeting, and we discussed the, um, the board issue our November agreement with the school board was that they would that we would rotate a member of the school board representative of the board. So if we went to a five member um, board of directors, we could designate that fifth person as the school board representative, and then that would the city and county each would have two um, appointees over there for their full term. And keep well, the the school board member is a full term. Yeah, and the full term, but we have to rotate it. We have to switch it between and I think you'd still time. have to do that. But if but if you could designate that and then the discussion of putting um, a staff member from the development services department that meets the city and the county to help make Are sure we limited to five members? Yes. Oh. Yeah. The so new law says you can have between five oh, and that's eleven great. as long as it's an odd number. Sorry. So you can have up to eleven. And so, but I think what if, if we want to base it off what the board has already approved, it's five. Again, I'm not sure that that approval 
was done correctly. So currently they're saying they can only have five because that's what they've approved. If we're gonna sort of start all over, then you could have more than that. But yeah. this, okay. And so what we're discussing is how we have, because we feel, uh, I think, from our side, and as well as the county side, is that we have been limited of what our input has been in terms of a direction. And, and this would give us more ownership of the organization to use it as a tool for the greater good of each of the city and the county's vision. I, I think looking at you know, the view of GI, GIS map of all of our city, all the city properties, when I go on there, she mentioned you go in there, it says land bank, land bank, land bank, but the right of redemption may not have been. Right. So it gives that perception as me when I say I look over the Thomas DeMille village here and you see you know, 30 or 40 lots, but maybe half of those aren't even in our control. So some type of overlay document that gives us a crystal clear look at what are, what is. I, I, I don't think we have the authority to to do that kind of oversight of the land bank. But, yeah, but, but to give everybody a clear, a crystal clear understanding what is then we would be trying to micromanage them just like we would want to try to manage, try but, to manage but, the development authority. But if we had a staff member that was there. The staff member would be a board member. The board member, the right. Man. But they would, it's not saying that we, just having something so that we can answer the constituent calls and says, this mm -hmm. lot next to mine would show the land bank and figure it out. But it may not really be the land banks. Well, we, do, we can do that now. Yeah. They call it as uh, some of anybody in planning development about a lot and they can tell me who it is. But that was when the land bank was established. What we had to understand as a city and county, we funded them, but they're an authority to themselves. Correct. We don't, we can't, we don't have the ability or the right to have that kind of oversight over, over them. Now, what, what we ever we put in these documents as agreement, that's where we, we will be able to have some kind of oversight, but other than that, we don't, uh, what, you, what you're talking about, we can't do that. But I think we can be a part of the conversation in terms of the vision of where we want to go with lots that are inside the city in certain areas. Well, that's established in the agreement in the that agreement. there's supposed right. to be a consensus. But I, I think what I understood is that we don't actually even know what portions of the agreement we are operating on. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, we know what's here, and I can sort of tell you, and I think the church could either tell me I'm wrong or also agree that there's a lot of stuff in, the, in this agreement that we're not doing currently. For instance, we, we're almost there, but we're supposed to provide the audit for the authority. We've been talking about their audit for years. Well, they're supposed to provide us and the county quarterly financial reports detailing the counting activities during that period. And then the audit shall be conducted on a ro rotating basis with the first audit to be done by the city auditor, the second by the county auditor, and rotating thereafter. Uh, they didn't have an audit until last year? Last year, I'm going to say what it does. Well, it doesn't say who pays for it, it just says the auditor you have to pay. <laughs> well, we used to say the Right, they didn't use Lawn and Jenkins, so does that mean they should use the counties next year? And why didn't we do that until last year when we've been in existence for 12? Um, so that's, I mean, that, that's sort of what I'm getting at. I think what I'm hearing is that Ms. Church and I need to spend some time together on exactly what the authority wants. I sort of know that y'all want, um, it sounds like, to continue with this agreement and just enforce it and also make sure that we um, maybe add in that it needs to be owner-occupied. If we'll, we'll get back to the... My place into these spots. acquisition of property and then in the um, administration of properties and disposition of properties that that's really the main thing and the disposition is where we can say sort of how we want it to go the criteria for conveyance and I, I think that is where you can have some oversight it just needs to be agreed upon by the city and the county because we're the ones that established the land bank with this agreement um, so if that's what we want to do we can certainly work on that um, and bring it back to you at a later workshop. I think it'll have to be later in the year. I'm not sure that it's something that's gonna be an easy answer that we can have to you in two weeks. But I think we're at a much better point um, with Ms. Church and her ability to work through these things than we have been in the past. The interview with the Housing Authority, 
do y'all want to proceed with that as well to bring that back so that they can continue to maintain the lots in the city? What's the time frame on having to make a decision on that? Well, it's expired now, so it's sort of automatically renewed, and we just continue doing it by written agreement saying we'll bring it back. But we need to, in fairness to Keith, we need to get the correct properties that he is maintaining, which he's provided, add those to it, and in all honesty, we need to increase the price that well, we're paying. Well, that's, I think my thing is absolutely if that's the decision that we choose to go, but I think it would be easier for me to make a decision knowing how we intend to move forward or what changes to make to the land bank. Um, this feels very service delivery strategy to me in terms of there's a lot of information floating around that's not being correctly utilized. Um, so I would, yes, if, if it costs more than what it is, then we need to pay what the, the value of it is. So I certainly don't want to cheat anybody out of it, but I don't want us to make another agreement in the midst of having some uncertainty about what we're actually going to do or have because I, I hear lots of questions about the future of them being self-sustaining and some of those other things and i think our thoughts about that could factor into the the maintenance of the property i was doing it we maintain i've called a lot of times about that but I, i'm just leery of us making a decision to then come back in a few months and say like oh crap we shouldn't have did it yet because we needed to adjust Whatever. Well, I did invite the housing authority here today, and they are here. I think they sort of know Keith better and could probably speak more on his behalf than I could. I, so far, it's not been a problem to continue sort of month by month. Do you all see that being a problem until we can extend this MOU? No? You think that's okay? Yeah, the problem is you can't have a problem with Can we make a motion that we raise the price for cheap? You know, what, what do we need to do? What, what kind of money? I mean, well, it just it completely depends on the lot. For instance, I think maybe Mr. Cullen sent me an email or Ms. Walker last week saying this really needs to have an initial cut before he can maintain it fairly. I think it was $130 or $140, and I said, please do. Um, we keep with code enforcement going over down three officers, so we have one. Um, we can't keep up, like Mr. Bill said, with our trash pickup and all of that for special handling, especially. And that's another thing that happens on these land bank lots. People realize they're vacant, um, they're not owned. They're going to say, oh, well, the land bank can't take care of it right now, and this person just got rid of it six months ago. And people know they're not dumb, and they'll go dump there. And so the city's got to pick it up at a cost to us, or we're not going to get reimbursed for it. Um, but Keith is sort of taking that on himself right now, which is just not fair, but I really don't know how to give you a price on what that is, because it just depends on what's happening that day. Is there a way that you can, I would love to have an aerial map or tax map and then mark what lots that we are responsible to cut. So we do, you know, just give us an idea of where we're at in, in the communities. I have no problem with doing a new contract. Because well, whether, we, whether the Mountain Bank Authority continues as is or or we've made changes we're in, the, in the future, we're still open to the, the um, Housing Authority will be our partner in, in addressing. So I'm not really that's going to matter whether keep moving forward. If I, why don't, if I can bring this back in two weeks at the nighttime meeting with just maybe a short-term contract instead of something that's extended for a long time. And remember again, this is very seasonal, so come November, we won't have these issues. But if we do this for a couple of months, bring it back, I don't know if I can have a map at this point, but at least. But at some point, it's pretty a big list. Well, we have a ton of lists, but yeah, they, but they change. Need to, yeah. <laughs> he has already provided three, so I know what he's cutting as of, gosh, when did we meet? I think July, June. Um, so we know what he's cutting as of that time. So based on what he had been and what the exhibit was, I think we could come up with a number, another number that would be reasonable for a couple of months. And then, so Ms. Flowers, I think her point is very valid that we don't do something while we're still, you know, talking about the overarching principles of land bank. If we could do that just for the time being, I'll bring that back at the next meeting. And then in a month or so, Ms. Church and I will have a better understanding of what this interlocal cooperation agreement needs to be. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Sound good, everybody? Yeah, that works for me. Thank you. <laughs> Last item of business today is to consider executive session pursuant to the CGA section 5014 for the purpose of meeting with this attorney to discuss pending potential litigation. Do we have a motion to go into the session? Mr. Tinsel with a motion, Ms. Murray with a second. All in favor. Thank you all for being here today.